Good morning, Michael Marmot. Are you there? <clears throat> um, I think I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you and I can see you. And uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be the one introducing you to this conference. Um, I have heard about you and known you since many years, and I can tell the people that uh, Sir Marmot uh, is the title because you had the most eminent epidemiologic research and, and so many years. And one thing which I always found is that you are uh, not only excellent researcher, but you also have very uh, interesting ways of new ways of analyzing. One of the first paper I read was, why do Japanese live longer? Uh, and uh, there you compared Japanese living in Japan, Japanese living in Hawaii, and Japanese living in United States. And as Japanese turned to a more westernized diet, they lived shorter. Uh, beyond that, you also have been the chair of the uh, first, uh, you chaired the, fir the first and very big uh, commission for equity in health by the WHO, uh, which even though the gap is so enormous, you landed in closing the gap in a generation. And that has inspired so many of us all, all over the world. And also here in Sweden, we are in Malmö where the first local commission was and in Östergötland we had a local commission. And by this, uh, uh, it's so interesting to hear you today speak over the title. Often now we had the COVID-19 who even worsen this to show that we can build back not only better, but also fairer. And as I told you, finally, I tend to say when I have speeches that Michael Marmot was my opponent, actually. So welcome. Thank you. Um, and <clears throat> thank you for that kind introduction. Um, with any luck, this will work. You can see my slides and it's moving, yeah. Can you just confirm that you can see my presentation? Yes, we can see it, yeah. Thank you. Uh, exactly as you said, um, we produced, my Institute of Health Equity produced four reports with the name Build Back Fairer. As I'll show you, where we were before the pandemic was not ideal. And that suggests not just building back better, as President Biden has said in the US, but we should build back fairer. I'm going to show you mainly data from the UK, not because I think you should be interested in England, although you probably have read that we've got various ceremonial activities going on as I speak with um, the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Uh, but because we have very good data from the UK and it illustrates the issues, the challenges to building back fairer. I will throw in a little bit of data. Um, we've been asked by the relatively new Norwegian government to advise them. And that's quite interesting, actually, because Norway, on the scale of things, as is Sweden, um, look pretty good from the point of view of health and health equity. And yet countries like Norway, like Sweden, say we can do better. Uh, we need to address these issues. So none of us is immune from this whether you're a very poor country, a very rich country, a very healthy country like Norway or Sweden, um, there's much to do. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, was what good does it do to treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? Particularly during a pandemic, we think a great deal about the health care system and in Britain, the healthcare system is on its knees because of a decade of underfunding and then the pandemic. But my concern is with the conditions that make people sick in the first place. And this has been 
in a way, the theme that's run through all our work. Uh, these are data from England. Each dot represents a neighborhood classified by level of deprivation, the index of multiple deprivation, uh, neighborhood, least deprived, most deprived, and we've got life expectancy for females and for males. And what you can see is that the most deprived have shorter life expectancy than everybody else. But that's not the extent of the inequalities. It's a gradient. People in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. People near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. It's a gradient that runs all the way from top to bottom. And that means the challenge is not just to break the link between poverty and ill health, but to reduce the social gradient. Margareta mentioned that I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We published our report, Closing the Gap in a Generation, in 2008. Following that, the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Gordon Brown, invited me to conduct a review in England. His question to me was, how can we apply the findings and recommendations of your global commission to one country, England? So I conducted what became known as the Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, published in 2010. In February 2020, on the 10 year anniversary of the Marmot Review, just before the pandemic crashed upon us, we looked back and asked what's happened in the last 10 years. I made a whole series of recommendations of how to reduce health inequalities. What happened? And the easy answer is we've lost a decade and it shows. Life expectancy from 1980. In fact, I could take it back to 1890 and it looks the same. Life expectancy had been improving about one year every four years for women and for men. And in 2010, there was a break in the curve. The rate of improvement slowed and just about ground to a halt. What happened in 2010? We had a new government elected, a conservative led coalition government. Let me put it this way. If the government had had as an explicit policy to stop health improving, they could pat themselves on the chest and say, by golly, we did it. No one else has managed this, but we did it. It may not surprise you to know that the government didn't boast about worsening the health of the country. In fact, when I published this, they said, well, you can't be alleging it was anything we did that could have led to this slowdown. Perhaps we just reached peak of expectancy. It's got to slow down sometime. So we looked at the countries. The improvement in life expectancy between 2011 17 Estonia, there's Norway right up there, Hungary, Denmark, Belgium, Sweden. Well, an improvement, not as good as some other countries. And there's the UK, the slowest improvement of any rich country except Iceland and the United States. No, we had not reached peak life expectancy. Countries that had longer life expectancy than us had bigger improvements. The government couldn't get off the hook that way. When we published the report, I was a bit cautious. After all, the government had as its number one priority, austerity, rolling back the state. 
And the obvious question is, could that set of policies had led to what we saw? Before answering the question, let's look at inequalities. This is women, the least deprived 10%, most deprived 10%. Huge differences in life expectancy between the least and most deprived. And each of these represents a region. And you can see the regional differences are quite small for the least deprived. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. And there was a small improvement in life expectancy. If you're poor, it matters a great deal where you live. The regional differences are much bigger. Life expectancy was going up in London, but was going down in virtually every region outside London. So this is where we were pre-pandemic. <coughs> Excuse me. This is where we were pre-pandemic. Life expectancy had stopped improving. Inequalities were increasing. And life expectancy for the poorest people was getting worse. That's a terrible state of affairs. You can see why I talk about build back fairer. Post-pandemic, we should not be seeking to re-establish the status quo. The status quo was far from ideal. In my 2010 review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, and highly relevant to a cost of living crisis, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Healthy and sustainable places and communities and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. I'm very pleased that in the Swedish National Review, Olle Lundberg and colleagues, they had these same six. Uh, they also had people should have control over their lives and of course, equitable access to health care. So what happened post 2010? As I said, the government's priority was austerity, rolling back of the state. And by goodness, they achieved it. In 2009-10, public sector expenditure was 42% of GDP. That went down year on year. By 2018-19, it was 36%. They really did roll back the state. In my 2010 review, I coined the phrase proportionate universalism. I was trying to combine two approaches. The classic Anglo-Saxon approach is you target the worst off. A more Nordic approach is you have a universalist policy that includes everybody. So this was a classic British compromise. Let's have universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. So this is what it might look like. Here's the social gradient in health, life expectancy, say, social distribution, better life expectancy. If we focus only on the poorest, we miss these other parts of the gradient. Let's have universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. What did we get post 2010? This is spending by local government. The grey bars are total local authority service spending per person. In the decade after 2010, in the least deprived 20% of areas, the spending per person went down by 16%. And then the, the deprivation, the great reduction in spending. In the most deprived areas, the total local authority spending per person 
went down by 32%. What we've got here is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could this have played a role in the slowdown and improvement in life expectancy? The increase in inequalities in health? The fact that life expectancy for the poorest people was getting worse? Yeah, I think it could. Let me summarize by saying for my six domains of recommendations, most of them moved in the wrong direction post 2010. So let's start with giving, giving every child the best start in life. Child poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. In 2010, 11, 17% of children were in poverty before housing costs are taken into account. After housing costs are included, that 17% rises to 27%. And over the decade, 27% went up to 30%. There was a rise in child poverty. How was that achieved? Is change in net household income due to tax benefit reforms by income from 2010 on? So let's look at the red, which is working age with children. So for those who are in the poorest decile of household income, as a result of changes the Minister of Finance made to taxes and benefits, their income would go down by 20%. Then for the next decile, go down by 12%. And then the richer they were, the less the reduction some reduction at the top, but nowhere near as big as the reduction at the bottom. Government policy was to make poor people poorer and to increase inequality. And they succeeded. And it was particularly the case for working age families with children. That was government policy. I won't go through all the others of my recommendations. I waited 10 years to do my 10 year on review. I waited only 10 months to do the COVID-19 Marmot review. We said at the beginning of the pandemic, when people said that the pandemic would be the great leveler, it would be no respect of class or position in society. And my response was rubbish. Any major shock from the outside exposes the underlying inequalities in society and amplifies them. And so it proved with COVID-19. Here's deciles of the index of multiple deprivation, all cause mortality, the gradient, it's a remarkable gradient. Each decile has higher mortality than the one above it, the one less deprived. That's all cause mortality. And here's COVID-19. The gradient's almost identical. It means the causes of inequalities in COVID-19 are very similar to the causes of inequalities in health more generally. Yes, we need a vaccine. Yes, we need to control the virus but we also need to address the inequalities. There's some slightly bigger excess at the bottom because of employment in frontline occupation, bigger excess for COVID because of employment in frontline occupations and living in overcrowded multi-generational households. And that's what I mean by expose and amplify the underlying inequalities. And so big was the impact of COVID-19 that life expectancy fell in 2020 quite sharply. And in fact, remember I said expose and amplify the underlying inequalities. 
This is life expectancy in England for the three years 2018 to 20 compared with the previous three years. And most of this is 2020, it's a pandemic effect. So by level of deprivation, for women, life expectancy fell in the bottom four deciles of de deprivation. For men, it fell in the bottom four deciles too, but it didn't really improve anywhere along the gradient, but the reduction was much bigger the more deprived you were. So the effect of the pandemic was to expose and amplify the underlying inequalities. And this is healthy life expectancy by for women by deprivation. And you can see the gradient for life expectancy and the gradient for healthy life expectancy is much steeper. It's not just length of life, it's quality of life. And women in the most deprived areas can expect to live a third of their shorter lives in poor general health. Colleagues in the US were concerned with the big decline in life expectancy in the US 2020 compared with 2019, 2021. And the other countries that showed poor performance, they compared the US with 19 other countries, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Germany, England and Wales. Hmm. We did really badly. By the way, here's Norway. I said we were doing work with Norway. This is the difference in life expectancy by level of education, compulsory, upper secondary, tertiary. And you can see that although health improved up to 2020, the gap got bigger, more marked for women than for men. The gap got a bit bigger for men. So I ask myself, what's going on here? If we think of the health as a measure of societal success, pre-pandemic in England, life expectancy was stalling, inequalities were increasing, and life expectancy for the poorest people was falling. And then during the pandemic, we had the highest excess mortality in the first wave, and over two years, we looked pretty poor. Only the US looked worse. So what's the link between poor health pre-pandemic and poor management of the pandemic? And I think the link works at four levels, poor governance and political culture, increasing social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services. We were ill prepared coming into the pandemic and we were unhealthy. And that's why I want us to build back fairer. So what would building back fairer look like? Come back to my recommendations. Give every child the best start in life. Is public spending on early child education and care for children aged 0 to 5? The OECD average is about $6,000 per child. Sweden, it's just under 12,000. Norway is just over $12,000 per child. The UK, so the average for the rich countries, OECD, is 6,000. The UK, we're not the worst. We're not very good. We limp along below average at around $4,000 per child. Thank goodness for the US, we never look worse. The US always looks worse than us, terribly grateful, at about $3,000. Building back fairer means investing in early childhood, looking at Norway, Sweden, Denmark, France, Finland, Korea. Child poverty, 41 rich countries, the best ranked in terms of child poverty, Ireland, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland. 
Sweden, not as good as it was. There's Sweden. The worst, the United States, Israel, Romania and Turkey. 38, 39, 40, 41. The US ranks 38th out of 41 and the United Kingdom 31. Before tax and benefits, before redistribution, child poverty in Finland is higher than in the US. But Finland and these other countries use the tax and benefit system, redistribution, to reduce child poverty. It's a political decision. How much child poverty do you want? And in Norway, percent of households in poverty levels for all households and those with children aged 0 to 17. And you can see households with children have higher poverty levels than all households. And although it's at a very low level, it's been rising, even in Norway, which is why they've asked for our advice. Uh, how can they do better? And of course, one of the issues in Norway is a percent of those aged 0 to 17 who are immigrants from Africa and Asia uh, in different counties and percent of households with children aged 0 to 17 below 60 percent of median income in different counties. So there's big variation and there tends to be an overlap. Um, we can discuss causation. Education, particularly during lockdown, access to computers from home. In the Netherlands, nearly 100%. Luxembourg, Finland, Germany, Estonia, Austria. Um, big differences, Greece, uh, much lower. And that, of course, relates to the educational divide during the pandemic. Still in childhood, Looking at performance and PISA scores, low word score, by the number of points in time between infancy and age 14, when a child lived in poverty. None, once, two to four times, five or six times. And the greater the number of times a child lived in poverty, the worse they perform on vocabulary at age 14 the more likely they are to be obese and the more likely they are to be depressed. Childhood poverty has ill effects throughout the life course. And education, I'm in England. If we look at real term changes in per pupil funding from year to year, 2015-16, there was some increase in pupil funding for the top four quintiles and reduction for the bottom quintile. And in these years, there was a reduction in per pupil spending in education, but the reductions were biggest in the most deprived area. And during the pandemic, when the funding went up, it still went up more in more affluent areas. Pre-pandemic, over the decade, the spending per pupil on education went down by 8%. And percent of people believing they have strong social supports, I'm giving you Norwegian data, 2015, 2019, um, it relates to education. The more educated people are, the more likely they are to report they have strong social supports. Education is in a sense psychosocial, but they're real physical exposures. Um, PM 2.5, air pollution, EU 27, Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary, Greece, high levels of air pollution 
exceeding WHO guidelines, Iceland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Estonia, uh, Ireland, much lower levels. In Britain, there's a link between air pollution and living in poverty. The greater the poverty level, the greater the air pollution level. So not only do children in poorer areas have less spending on education, poorer school provision, they're more likely to be exposed to air pollution. Fair employment and good work for all. Percent of those aged 16 to 25 not in education, employment or training. For immigrants in Norway, wow, it's around 30% that are not in empl education, employment or training. The general population, it's under 10%. And unemployment in 15 to 29 year olds in OECD countries, Costa Rica, Greece, Spain, Italy, Turkey, Japan, Germany, Israel, Czech Republic, Switzerland. Very big differences. And part of good work for all is what happens when you become unemployed. In Denmark, if you're unemployed, the unemployment benefit is 90% of previous earning. Sweden, 80%. Italy, 75 Germany, 60 In the UK, if you become unemployed, you get universal credit. And the universal credit is worth 14% of median income. It's not just job characteristics. We really punish people if they become unemployed. And COVID-19, if we look across Europe, led to a drop in disposable income much bigger in the more deprived deciles. So it was increasing inequality. At least this is what would have happened had there been no policy changes. But there were policy changes. So there was still a bigger drop in income in the more deprived deciles. But it was to some extent mitigated by the policy changes aimed at protecting income. But you can see that the pandemic, I repeat, exposed and amplified the inequalities in society. In this case, the drop in income. I said that our public expenditure in the UK had gone down to 36%. And we've just got a new prime minister. And she's complaining that we're a high tax country, that the level of taxation is too high. And I think, what? In Finland, it's 52% of government revenue is a percent of GDP. In France, it's 52%, Belgium, 50%, Sweden, 50%, Austria, Italy, Germany. We're a low tax country. Of course, the US is lower at 31%. So the prime minister wants to lower taxes for reasons that are slightly beyond me. She said, because it'll lead to economic growth. Well, I wouldn't mind if our economic growth looked like some of these higher tax countries. And then, so we've had these three threats, austerity, the second is the pandemic, and now the cost of living crisis, which is a potential humanitarian calamity. Surveys, these surveys get rapidly out of date. This is from February 2022. Overall, has the cost of living for your household increased, decreased, or stayed the same? And you can see in most countries, Sweden included, um, more than 60% of people say the cost of living has increased. And that was in February. It's gone up after the war in Ukraine started. It's gone up much more. 
and it means real hardship. I talk about taking a social determinants approach to prevention. In England, if people tried to follow the healthy eating advice, the NHS Eat Well Guide, if you were in the most deprived 10% of households, you would have to spend 74% of household income on food. Some of our politicians blame poor people for their poor diets. They say they don't know how to cook. They're too ignorant. They can't manage their budgets well. Don't blame the poor. Blame their poverty. To eat healthily, they would have to spend 74% of household income on food. I say things get out of date quickly. This was in May 2022, looking at income in September 2021 and projected income in September 2022. That's now, uh, it's already out of date. But take a single person with one child and that person is working 20 hours a week on low to median income. Let's say it's a woman and her income in September 2021 would have been £18,265 a year. The government had boosted universal credit, the welfare payment, by £20 a week, but then they took it away. So that would make her £1,040 a year worse off. Then inflation would make her £1,200 a year worse off. There'd be some salary increase and some reduction in taxation. The net is she'd have a loss of income of 3%. That doesn't sound much, but £584 a year lower income, £11 a week. If you're in poverty and you lose £11 a week, 14 euros or thereabouts, it's not just a choice between heating and eating, but if a calamity happens, if your child needs a new pair of shoes, forget it. This is a major threat to living standards. And this will affect the mental illness of parents as they struggle to make ends meet. And that in turn will affect the brains of developing children and their social, cognitive, linguistic development. Then the government had an ambition to level up and they produced a levelling up white paper. The idea being that the more deprived parts of the UK should be levelled up to approach those of the less deprived parts. A 330 page white paper, the analysis was very good, I have to say. There were four missions, 12 objectives, and I thought I wrote an editorial for the BMJ, and I said, if these were met, health inequalities would diminish. The question is, how much investment was going to be put into it. The white paper pointed out that in Germany, when they incorporated the former German Democratic Republic, East Germany, into the Federal Republic, Germany spent 2 trillion euros over 25 years in levelling up. That's equivalent to about 70 billion pounds a year. Did it work? Well, here's life expectancy for women in the West, women in the East, reunification. Hey, that's pretty good. They closed the gap. Men, well, they narrowed the gap. They didn't quite close it. So Germany spent 70 billion pounds a year. The UK leveling up budget for four years was 4.8 billion, 1.2 billion pounds a year. A wonderful white paper, 
but if the government's not going to put any money into it, we're going to continue with the big regional and social inequalities in health. A think tank, IPPR North, calculated that the 2021 allocation of levelling up fund amounted to £32 per person in the North. I've shown you the drop in council spending. That annual drop is equivalent to £413 per person per year in the North. So the government took away £413 per person per year. They're going to give you back £32. Now we're going to level up. This is insulting. We're doing our own levelling up. Let's move away from the depressing situation of what's been happening at national level. Coventry, after my 2010 review, declared itself a Marmot City. Greater Manchester invited us in. They said if Coventry can do it, we'll be a Marmot City region. Luton, last week, declared itself the first Marmot town. Waltham Forest in East London. Cheshire and Merseyside, Lancashire and Cumbria, Leeds wants to join in, the north of Tyne, Newcastle, Gwent wants to be the first Marmot region in Wales. In Coventry, what does it mean to be a Marmot city? They took my six domains of recommendations and they built government policy and the voluntary and community sector and the health services around these six domains of recommendations. We were invited to work with Greater Manchester and we produced a report, Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester, Health Equity and Dignified Lives. Altogether Fairer, Health Equity and the Social Determinants of Health in Cheshire and Merseyside. A Hopeful Future, Equity in the Social Determinants of Health in Lancashire and Cumbria. I think that's going to be October, not September. And I mentioned Luton was last week, Coventry. And businesses asked, what can we do? A major insurance and financial services company, legal in general, asked us, what could legal in general do to improve health and improve health equity? And funded by them, we produced a report, The Business of Health Equity, the Marmot Review for Industry. And we said there were three domains. Good quality work, pay your employees properly, and not just for legal in general, but for business in general. Good conditions of work. And we said this should be a no-brainer. Treat your employees well and they'll be more productive. It'll be good for your bottom line. Be a terrible employer and your productivity will suffer. The second is goods and services. You can produce goods and services that damage people's health or that improve people's health. And if you're a financial corporation like Legal in General, you don't affect, let's say, junk food. Yes, you do. They're major investors. They can choose where to place their investment and their investment decisions can influence company policies. And the third is the impact on the environment and the wider society, local communities, um, procurement, partnership, advocacy and lobbying and environmental impact. So building back fairer, my six domains of recommendations give every child the best start in life education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, a healthy standard of living for all, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and a social determinants approach to prevention. And we've now added to tackle discrimination, racism and their outcomes, and pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. And when asked, what would I say 
to a new government. I say deal with this previous diagnosis of poor governance and political culture, reverse the increasing social and economic inequalities, reverse the reduction in spending on public services and deal with the fact that we were very healthy. And overall, put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. Thank you.